welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Thomas Curran. He is the author of The Perfection Trap. He is also, and this is a mouthful, but he said I could say it anyways, an associate professor of psychological and behavioral science, research methods, and statistics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Look at me. I did that all. Thomas, how are you today? (laughs) <laughs> well done. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, not many people can get through that in one take. So good job. Excellent. I, <laughs> I, you know, they say I'm a professional, but who knows? But um, really, I, I'm just so grateful that we got to chat. Uh, when, when I learned about the perfection trap, I, I just thought it was something that was just so applicable to so many people that want to do things right. But before we get into the book uh, and, and, you know, your body of work, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about you and then we'll get into some questions. Absolutely. Yeah. So I am an academic, uh, which means I teach uh, students about uh, the w- wonderful world of psychological and behavioral science, I uh, just teach them statistics too. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's always a joy, but not necessarily the what the subject that students necessarily go to study psychology to uh, learn about. But nevertheless, I think it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, a, a little bit of background, come from a small town. Um sort of work my way up the hard way, I suppose you could say, to get where I am, uh, which is, you know, a lot of uh, challenge along the way. Uh, But you just say yes to every opportunity that comes and sometimes you end up uh, doing great things. And and yeah, so here I am and just loving it, really loving doing the book. It was great to write it. um, And I'm just really enjoying talking to people about perfectionism and hopefully um, revealing a little bit more about this curious trait. Absolutely. And so what's interesting is, you know, you mentioned in your in your intro, you're like, hey, I did a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I basically had to do it the hard way. It didn't work out like I wanted to. And then you come behind that with your, your studies of, of psychology, how the human brain works. And then ultimately you write the book on, you know, perfectionism and when good enough is, well, good enough. Uh, so maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about the premise of the book and then I'll ask you, you know, how it can apply to everybody's kind of natural life. Yeah, the premise of the book really comes from my own experience. I, I definitely consider myself to be a perfectionistic person and uh, certainly that's one of the reasons, I guess, you could say that I've made, I've been able to uh, reach the uh, stage in life that I have in terms of my professional successes. But it doesn't mean that it's come without cost. And a lot of that cost came in a lot of psychological difficulties, pushing myself to hard sacrificing areas of my life, which um, I really, you know, regret sacrificing time with friends, time with family, um, time in, commun- in my community and all the rest of it, which was just really sacrificed to, to work, 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 work. Um, so research is definitely me searching in this respect. I, 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 I succumbed uh, in my late twenties to perfectionism. I had a, what I would consider to be a breakdown and, um, my, you know, I really needed help at that point. And I was brought to the awareness that it was perfectionism that far from helping me, um, and what I thought was, you know, this kind of very intense drive that was uh, taking me forward was actually amplifying a lot of the stress and strains I, feel it, I was feeling in my life, was making it more difficult to rest and recover. And ultimately, it was creating the psychological problems um, that I was trying to, um, I suppose, resolve with perfectionism. So it's a really curious trait in that respect. We think it's doing us good, but actually uh, it can do us a lot of a lot of harm. And, and so that was the impetus, I suppose, to work in this area. Uh, there wasn't much done on it. So I've done a lot of research now and um, over time kind of looked into what perfection is, what it does to us. And importantly, what's going on out there in wider culture? Why is it that lots of people feel like me? They need to work and hustle and grind and reach for the perfectionistic um, standards all the time. And uh, so the work I've been doing is showing that a lot more people are a lot more perfectionistic uh, in recent years. And uh, I think that's something that we need to talk about. Perfect. So what are what does the research say about perfectionism? What does the research say about folks that are uh, dealing with perfectionism? And then I'll ask you about how to, you know, address it. Yeah, sure. So perfectionism is a form of deficit thinking. And this is the first thing we, I think listeners need to uh, really grasp because it, it 
it differentiates perfectionism from things that we think of perfection is like conscientious, particulars, diligence, all these things are really amazing ways to strive, come from a healthy, active, optimistic place and wanting to do more, wanting to improve, wanting to get better, all the rest of it. Perfection isn't that. Perfection comes from a very, um, I suppose, dark place, darker place in the sense that I at root i don't feel enough at root i feel like i'm imperfect that i have shortcomings or flaws um and if those shortcomings or flaws are revealed to the world then everyone's watching they're waiting to pounce and they're waiting to let me know and so really it's just it looks like high striving on the surface but really it's a it's, it's a cloak it's like a defensive mechanism to try and conceal those inner imperfections that we're deeply ashamed of now if you can start there with perfectionism you can begin to unpack so some of its more negative out, uh, aspects right so that 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 deficit thinking leads to a lot of self-criticism self-loathing when we haven't done things uh, quite as well as we should have and it also creates quite rigid and quite obsessive forms of striving unsustainable forms of striving that mean that we kind of put ourselves through the ringer a lot of the time because we feel like we have to keep going we have to keep moving forward we cannot stop because if we stop then we show some chink we show some vulnerability where we show that we're willing to slow down and perhaps settle for less than perfection and of course all these things are really um important um aspects of the, the perfectionistic person's self-esteem so it's it's really that's the crux of it and that's why it's so so problematic um and we know that the literature tells us that there's a very strong relationship between perfectionism and mental health outcomes things like anxiety depression um yeah, self-presentational concerns um and all the rest of it Thank you for that. One of the reasons that I wanted to have uh, this conversation today is because if you look at like organizations, organizations is just cons consists of people and people yeah. have lives outside of work. It's not just the work that they do, it's their, their family life. So the reason you I wanted you as the listener to be able to kind of experience this is to consider for yourself, hey, you know, is there something that might apply to me and is there a way to um, address it if I so choose? Now, the flip side of that or the, I don't know, parallel is what you had mentioned, Thomas, when you're starting, you're saying, hey, I have been able to accomplish so much because of my perfectionism. And I can hear my internal self, by the way, I'm a C student, not an A student. So I have given up perfection. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I won't go there. But um, I could hear the inner dialogue of, of high performers saying, but I like my perfectionism. It's mm. gotten me to the point where I have, but kind of building or reflecting from what you said is saying, yes, but there's a cost to the perfectionism. Yeah. So what have you found, you know, outside of your own experience, what is the cost of that perfectionism so that our audience can consider whether they want to continue that path or not? Well, here's the thing. And I hear this a lot. And Anthony, you're on the you're on the money here because this is something that whenever I talk about perfection and danger of perfection, I get this, but I get this a lot. Well, I I'm a perfectionist person, and perfectionism is what's got me to the top. And I would say um, to those people that, that perfectionism is part of your psychology. I'm sure it is, but it it won't have been what's got you to the top. What's got you to the top of things outside of perfectionism um, that are just as important. But your perfectionism per se is probably um, given you no more um, likelihood to succeed. And we know that from the data, by the way, it's very weak relationship between perfectionism. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure there is a weak relationship between perfectionism and performance. So that's what and I heard performance, you say. A okay. very weak to non-existent relationship. Um, so, so you probably got to the top despite not because of your perfectionism, if we, if we're going on the data alone and, and, then, and I think the reason we hold perfectionism so close and so dear, and we truly, sincerely believe it was a perfectionism that propelled us um, to the top when perhaps there were other factors that were just as, if not more important, um, social circumstances, being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people at the right time, you know, all of these kind of very circumstantial factors that are just as important when it comes to understanding why people are successful above and beyond work and perfection. Right. These things are important. I'm not saying they're not, but there is also a bigger picture to success that we need to consider. And it isn't just the work and it isn't just the perfectionism that uh, led to those outcomes. There are other there are other things just important. And and I think that's important because it speaks to something that I see all the time and out there in wider culture. Like you see, all we do is platform the winners, the successful, the, the CEOs, the Fortune 500 leaders, the elite athletes, um, the actors. Uh, the musicians people who have actually made it through some really competitive selection process to get to the top and we ask them how did you get there they'll say my perfectionism 
what we're not seeing is what's going on underneath that elite. And what's going on underneath that elite is millions and millions of people are doing exactly the same things, but without the Grammy, Forty Five Hundred Company, the Oscar, whatever, to show for it. Um, and this is classic survivor bias. And this is why we think we think perfectionism is the root secret to success. But actually, it's only because we're only ever talking to the winners. And if we talk to the people that didn't quite make it, they would tell us a very different story. They would they would tell us that they tried and strove in incredible discomfort and didn't quite get over the line for reasons that perhaps uh, are out of their control. As I mentioned earlier, circumstances, luck, happenstance, being in the right place at the right time just didn't quite work out from on that occasion. And it. And so I think we need to be really careful about that selection effect. And I hear this all the time because when, as I say, if you look at the data, no, no relationship to perfectionism and, and performance. I can talk about what, why that is, but I think what you said there is really critical because I hear this a lot. Well, I think, um, yeah, it, interesting to see, Hey, what do you attribute the success to? Because it could be persistence over perfection. Exactly. Uh, and, and and a bunch of other things. Well, interesting experience that we have in our own lives. So my wife and I have a now soon to be 15 month your child in two days. And my wife is somebody who aims to be perfect. And in my eyes, of course, she's perfect uh, as long as you send this podcast to her. Uh, but uh, that she really struggled with it and then realized that as much of planning as you want to do with an infant child, a baby child, that the baby is going to do what the hell they want, and it's going to turn out how it turns out. And so yeah. despite your best intentions, um, you know, it, it, it gives you the space to realize that perfection isn't really a thing because it's more maybe adaption uh, that, that supports that. Uh, any thoughts? I, I just, you know, thought of that now, but any thoughts between adaption and perfection? Absolutely. I mean, having a child is probably the biggest sledgehammer you can take to perfectionism because you soon realize um, in very short order that you are reduced to nothing more than a helpless spectator in, in their show. Um, and this is, and this is, and this, that, that need for control, that need to try and perfect everything and all around us. Well, sometimes there are situations where that simply isn't going to work. It is not possible. And that's okay. And it's not just in the context of parenting, it's in the context of broader life. You know, heartbreak, grief, uh, health scares will come along in your life all the time. A global pandemic is going to come along and screw that business plan up that you, you were so close to uh, putting out there, you know. You can't do anything about it. Like that's, just, that's just fate. And I think it's really important to remember, listeners, that fate is nothing personal. Like it is, it's just sometimes it happens crap happens and there's nothing you can do about that and it and perfectionists really struggle to deal with that concept because everything and all around them has to be controlled has to be uh, perfected and if you can just let that go if you can accept that sometimes life is just going to happen to you and that's okay then then honestly that's the best way to push through perfectionism and having a child is uh one of the best ways you can do that uh, can I ask, uh, you know, I, the work that I've done, and we study a lot of organizational behavior, people behavior in the work that we do, and I study a lot of personal psychology, and I'm not a psychologist, um, but how much does, in your research, and you might not have an answer, does a uh, lack of control during the formative years, call it like 8, 11, 13, and like a significant incidence that was like ingrained in the wiring of the brain impact a person's future desire for control. And I'll speak for myself, where I had an experience when I was younger that I didn't have control over my money in a certain situation. I wanted to buy a thing. I wasn't able to buy it or I wasn't given the permission to spend the money on it. And therefore, I now need to control my money. And that's why I'm an entrepreneur and do the things I have to do. So have you found there a correlation between a formative lack of control, out of control feeling, and a desire to try to control everything? 100%. <laughs> so it's such a it's such a close it's such a close relationship and those formative years are so so important we live in a very consumerist society and if you've got the means to afford the idealized standard of life that's being back at us from tv screens billboards social media then you're going to be all right but most of us don't and actually i grew up very poor didn't have a great deal and um, every time I saw my friends with the new, latest trainers or the newest phones and gadgets and um and then when we got older, a bit older, and got the got the newest cars and the rest of it, I was ashamed. It's so, it's so stupid. It's only stuff. But 
I felt so embarrassed because consumer culture teaches you that if you don't have those things, there must be something wrong with you. And uh, and that really carried through that that carried through me. The the overcompensation in, in later life to try to make up for those feelings of lack um was was part of the part of the perfectionist treadmill that I started to get myself entrenched on because really like you know it's it's exactly as you said if you don't have control in that moment if you feel that like these things are out, out of region you simply can't attain them uh then then that angst that tension that worry that, that inner sort of conflict that you feel between this person you are but the person you want to be that, that what we call that sort of differential uh, when you suddenly get into later life and you are able to enact a little bit more control, you're going to go on overdrive because you didn't have these things in the formative years. So very close relation between these things for sure. That. So let's say that our audience or yourself, whoever's listening, you, the listeners listening and saying, hey, you know what, maybe I don't want the the side effects of perfectionism. Maybe I want to be able to release uh, some of that stress and, and hold and let go of some of the um, expectations I have on myself uh because they don't necessarily serve you any longer let's take that case um what are some things that people can do to recognize or help them recognize that good enough is good enough uh the best thing to do is a, a sport experiment in your mind like think about i mean your listeners are successful individuals um very business minded and i'm sure will be creating developing businesses and um taking risks um in a very entrepreneurial way now this is a process and uh, that requires a hell of a lot of perseverance but also requires a lot of failure and a lot of tinkering and a lot of iteration and it's important to recognize that there is no perfect business just as there's no perfect presentation just no no perfect research paper there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of good enough businesses and papers and presentations each of which will lead to the same outcomes but just in slightly different ways and it's really important to recognize that that's the goal that's the aim that's the outcome or should be the outcome of what we're trying to do we're trying to create something that is good enough the returns uh the you know the appeals to the people that we're trying to appeal to that, that draws a profit that grows and all the rest of it and all of those things don't have one perfect pathway they have many different good enough pathways and that and that's useful because that helps us let go it helps us let go of the idea um, when we're comfortable that it's good enough rather than waiting, iterating, trying to change it, uh, improve it, get it better, and then it never going out at all. So this idea that, you know, progress is way better than perfection. I know it's a cliche, but it's so, so um, important. And and in our own lives, I think we also need to challenge our perfectionism in, in really important ways too. So just as it's important to get stuff out there, accept that when things are good enough and let it go, we also have to reflect on that process too, because often we'll catastrophize the outcome of giving something up, which is why we are reluctant to give it up in the first place. So test those ideas, put something out there, even if you don't think it's quite there yet, just put it out there, see what happens. What's the reception? And is it cat as catastrophic as you think it is, even if it doesn't go well, let's say it flops. Well, what's the outcome? How does that feel? Has it been a, this kind of ultimate catastrophe that you, in your mind's eye, played up to be? No. And you learn a great deal about yourself in those moments because that perfect business, that perfect person that you're trying to put out into the world is not worth living in fear for. All right, things will go wrong. You're going to fail way more than you're going to succeed. And it's absolutely fine. Keep moving forward. Keep developing. What can you learn? Keep moving. So put things out there. Don't, don't be afraid to show your vulnerability. Progress is better than perfection. And um and and that is really the most important things to bear in mind when you're trying to break through your imperfection. Yeah. Uh, and what I take away is like there is possible there's a possibility that something you do not do perfect does turn out into a catastrophe. So we don't want to say that, hey, there's no way that that's going to happen, but the likelihood of it being as bad in your brain in its truest form um, mm. it, it is unlikely. Um, and that you'll you'll realize, hey, where can I, there's an opportunity cost to it. So for me, as I alluded to, I was a C student. I always approached it that there's an opportunity cost for me to get from a C to a B to an A. And yes, I thought that way in high school. I said, I would rather use that extra time. And it gets tighter and tighter like it's more and more expensive as you get closer to the top so i said okay i'd rather put that time somewhere else to be a generalist um and then you know an example for me i launched a course several years ago and i said hey it's going to be ugly but effective you know it's not going to be pretty but it's going to be good enough and then i can iterate so the, the idea of iteration i think is a strong one um 
I know it just as we finish up here, do you ever talk about the idea of minimum effective dose? And it's just how I think about that in the brain. Like you can boil water at a hundred Celsius. It doesn't matter if you get it to 110 or 120 because a hundred is the baseline. Do you ever talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, and that's the thing. A hundred really... in Canada, by the way, and probably the, the UK, yeah. I think, maybe <laughs> not in the US. Sorry if everybody's like, a hundred Fahrenheit, what the heck? Anyways, come on. <laughs> no, absolutely. Like it's, it, uh, perfectionists are really inefficient overstrivers. You know, they'll, they'll put in way, way more effort than most people just to attain the same outcomes um, because they just can't help themselves. Yes, this is true. Like working effectively for working smart and not harder is, is so important and recognizing what, you know, okay, what is the minimum threshold right now for me to, to get this task done out there, completed it onto the next thing. Okay. And, and being happy with that, accepting that and, and start holding yourself to that, not going, okay, now we're here. I want a bit better. No, right. Get it out. Get it gone. Next thing. Cause look, you got to move quickly in this economy. You can't really stand still for too long. And so getting stuff done, finding where, where your the comfort level of what's acceptable and then holding yourself to that is uh, so, so, uh, so, so important. So absolutely find that minimum threshold, stick to it, let it go, move on to the next thing, keep moving. That's the most important. Awesome. Uh, Thomas, thank you for the time today. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they connect with you and where can they get your book? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you type into Google, Thomas Curran, The Perfection Trap, uh, you'll find all the information about me and the book. And I would encourage your listeners, if you do grab a copy, to please do get in touch because uh, I'd love to hear from you. Excellent. And it looks like my camera shut off and that's what happens when things go in perfectly. So uh, <laughs> I will let you go there. So everybody watching online, you get to see Thomas before I sign off. But uh, really, thank you, Thomas. It's been such a pleasure uh, to meet you. Uh, Thomas Curran, the author of The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough. Uh, one of the things I learned from today is just, you know, how it how it's rooted in what you do and how as an individual within an organization, it can hold you back. Now, it's always a choice because you do get something from it otherwise you wouldn't do it my challenge to you the listener is um what are you sacrificing and which one is paying the greater cost um you might find a breakthrough in yourself you might find a lot more freedom recognizing you know that you could put that time energy focus somewhere else and get just good results um because you've been doing it this entire time so thomas thank you for the time today i'm sorry i can't wave at you and sign off but <laughs> i appreciate you being here today folks i appreciate you listening watching subscribing and we'll see you next time thank you again everyone Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.